Um, so um, I do want to, thanks for having me. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging um, the First Nations people of Australia um, for their enduring custodianship of the land. And I'm presenting to you today from Southern Yamaji lands where we acknowledge the Amangu, the Nagaja, the Nanagadi, the Wilinu and the Witi peoples and express my deep respect for their careful custodianship of this land. Um, for those who don't me don't know don't know me already, as Rachel said, my name is Catherine Allen, and I'm the CEO of NACNRM, which operates in the Northern Agricultural Region of WA. I'm based in Geraldton, which is about 500 kilometres north of Perth, and my region goes from just north of um, Geraldton, so um, the Calvary sort of area, all the way down to Gilderton, as you can see on that map, which is about 60 kilometres north of Perth. So it's about 600 kilometres of coastline, and we go inland to the historic clearing line where agricultural zone becomes pastoral country. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about ESG and NRM, as I said, which I think is a perfect union. Um, I'm going to touch on ESG frameworks and proprietary tools that exist um, because they are essentially a new market-driven tool which we as NRMs can use to expand the work that we do. Um, but it's great to hear that you guys have some natural capital sort of experts in uh, or specialists, I guess, in, in some of your regions. And so some of this might be a little bit too light touch for you. And I'm very happy to talk um, at, towards the end about, I guess, our experience and answer some specific questions about what we've found as we've started to develop up projects and work with partners um, in this space. Um, I'm going to start off by giving a bit of context in the ESG operating environment and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of NRM and ESG and how they're aligned and this is sort of more for the purpose of helping you think about how you might align um, projects that you might want to pitch to part potential partners uh, to, to sort of meet them um, where they are basically. And then I'm going to touch a little bit about strategic focus for ESG outcomes. Um, I don't think anything I have to say is particularly earth shattering. Um, and any of you who have been in the NRM space for a long time, some of this will be, you know, things that you have heard before. Um, but as I said, I'll just talk a little bit about how, what our experience has been towards the end. And I'm very happy to answer those questions. So the operating environment, um, something akin to choosing the right EMSA methodology in merit. It's complex. It depends on who you're speaking to at the time and there's no clear path forward. <laughs> One thing is for certain though, um, it's much more than carbon measurement and offset. Um, I'm going to use a few acronyms today and I do apologise for that. I will try and use the full term the first time and hopefully you're all very familiar with these acronyms. But if you're not, maybe Rachel, if you could pop them in the chat um, as we go along and um, just for their extended versions uh, in case I miss any. Um, to highlight the speed with which this whole space is accelerating, uh, the Financial Stability Board created the Task Force for Climate Financial, Climate Related Financial Disclosures in 2015. Um, and it was disbanded in 2023, essentially because the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures took over. By comparison, the TNFD initiative, which was launched in July 2020, had final recommendations released just over three years later in September 2023. So what took climate eight years to deliver in terms of a structure for disclosures and reporting has been delivered for nature in just three. And now that's got a lot to do with the interest and um, emphasis that's happened um, during that time, um, but it just shows you uh, how, how quickly this uh, sort of the interest in this space is accelerating. TCFD started out as a way to bring corporate entities to account for their impact on climate, essentially looking specifically at carbon emissions. The context for this is financial stability. Climate became an issue um, to address because the FSB realised that companies were being materially financially impacted by changes to the climate. Recently, there has been a rapid, rac rapid recognition that focusing on climate alone is a bit of a fool's errand. I guess that's um, the more recent realisation, something that we have all known for a very long time, is that nature is very complex. It's difficult to measure and it can be very difficult and expensive to reverse the damage which has been done. 
Fortunately, the focus is now not only on the negative impact which corporate entities can have on nature through their normal operations, but also on their reliance on nature to continue to do business. Oh, just listening to many. So if, we've got, if everyone could just mute, sorry, I think somebody's got a bit of a background conversation. Sorry, Catherine. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I don't know the other response or something. Yeah. Yeah. I am. I think you should be able to meet them. I haven't finished any. I'm doing accidental counsellor tomorrow. I think you can meet them, can't you, Rachel? As the um, host? There we go. Um, so, like mobile phone plans and um, even telcos, if you don't live in regional WA at least, there are many ESG frameworks and related principles that provide a structured approach for assessing and reporting a company's performance for environmental and social responsibility and government governance. It's entirely part possible that every partner that you work with will use a different tool. Um, what I think is important for us is that we understand the underlying structures and we're able to articulate how NRM work aligns with those underlying principles. Some of the most important underlying frameworks to be familiar with are the UNSGs, which are um, up on the screen at the moment, the TNFD and the ISSB, which is the International Sustainability Standards Board. The other important tool, of course, which is rapidly um, coming online is the natural capital accounting and associated tools um, with that. Um, but I guess for me, I'm a huge fan of natural capital accounting and I think it's a really important thing that we need to do, but I'm, um, I can't quite see how this is going to slot into some of these frameworks from a, um, I guess it's, it's a measurement tool. I see natural capital accounting as a measurement tool. Um, and obviously there is work that Accounting for Nature is doing to align um, their work uh, in the natural capital accounting space with TNFD and the SDGs. So natural capital accounting or environmental economic accounts are essentially a way of quantifying the value of ecosystems. Um, I guess uh, my concern with natural capital accounting for us in WA and for as part of the ESG framework is that the natural capital accounting is a tool of measurement um, it's not a mechanism that, um, that is going to drive um, our ability to deliver more outcomes, so drive revenue that we can deliver more projects. So that's kind of how we're thinking about it at the moment. Um, and we, I guess we're also hoping that there will be some direction around using a particular tool for um, natural capital accounting in the near future. Um, so Accounting for Nature, along with the GRI, CDP and GRESB and probably countless others are examples of proprietary reporting tools, standards or certifications which companies might choose to adopt to demonstrate their credentials. Um, to help you see how you might pitch for an ESG project, I'm going to use the TNFD framework and a mini pitch that we used at the ESG summit presentation as an example of the alignment between the work which NRMs do and ESG pro projects and that TNFD framework. So the task force uh, on nature related disclosures or TNFD requires that you report against four pillars relating to your strategic approach, how you manage risks, how you measure what you've achieved and your governance arrangements. When we presented this to businesses, the underlying principles which we aimed to reinforce along with the alignment um, with those principles were integrity, experience and agility, which are all things that um, we believe that the NRM industry has in spades. <clears throat> integrity is really essential so that your outcomes are trustworthy and verifiable, which is something that businesses are really um, obviously very, uh, very keen to make sure that they can demonstrate um, with the increasing greenwashing um, uh, sort of litigation um, and call out by the uh, Australian Consumer Commission. Sorry, my words my words are escaping me a little bit today. Um, <laughs> I was off sick yesterday and my brain is still coming back online. Um, so uh, 
Experience is also really critical because it reduces downtime and also provides access to stakeholders, which are really essential to ensuring social objectives. And agility is key to having shovel-ready projects that can be pragmatically and iteratively adjusted as they are implemented. In our experience, it's also important to think about values alignment for your projects and for your partnerships. Um, so I'm going to run through each pillar and point out how we can demonstrate the linkages between TNFD as just one example or one underlying driver of these ESG frameworks and what NRMs do every day. So I'm going to run through this sort of relatively quickly because it's essentially a cell that you guys don't need, um, but I thought it would be useful for you to see how we drew those linkages when we had this conversation directly with business. So one of the pillars of the TNS. TNFD is that um, businesses strategically manage um, and disclose their ESG activities. So a strategic boot, I'm going to have a drink of water, see if that helps. <laughs> A strategic approach to boots on the ground management of natural resources has been a cornerstone of the NRM network for 25 years. Um, we've, we've had strategies for a long time. We all have one, but the big strength of these plans from an ESG point of view is that they are community driven and scientifically verified, which makes them a really valuable tool for businesses to guide strategic investment in the E part of the ESG. So the second pillar is risk and impact management. Um, so that requires businesses to report against their processes in place to identify, assess and manage risks and impacts relating to ESG. NRM groups are really familiar with risk and impact measurement. Um, lots of the work we do is focused on threat abatement and measuring the impact of interventions. Um, there are four recommended disclosures in this pillar, and I won't read them out, but essentially they ask businesses to identify their own impacts, risks and opportunities, as well as those of upstream and downstream value chains and disclose how they will integrate those into their business, their businesses' overall risk management. So you can see it's quite comprehensive. Um, because this is a complicated network, as you can see in the jigsaw image, um, Many corporates, like large corporate entities, are going to have these complicated business structures and therefore complex requirements to meet um, their, their, their um, ESG needs. Um, and they're going to employ teams of people to do this. And I don't think we want to try and take that job. Um, in most cases, you know, for those organisations who've got relatively small teams in this space, um, you need to think about um, where your touch point is going to be for your organisation. But what we can provide is some grassroots thinking and local knowledge. We understand risk frameworks and we can help with prioritisation of um, need in the, e, in the environmental space as well. Um, but recognising our capability and knowing sort of where we're going to play in that space is really important. So what gets measured gets managed. The um, metrics and targets component is the third pillar of the TNFD. Um, and companies will need to demonstrate how they're going to, what metrics they're going to use and what targets they're going to have in um, their, in their um, disclosure space uh, around um, their, their impact on nature. So NRM groups have been doing monitoring for a long time and we're well adjusted to meeting the demands of several masters. Um, this is the slide that we use for our presentation at the ESG Forum in Perth, which was showcasing some of the work that my organisation's been doing with Mali Farm Monitoring Work. Um, one of the things that we emphasised here was our ability to not only do the boots on the ground monitoring work, but also to collaborate and to roll our data up into a national um, data set through the Adaptive Management Programme. Finally, we all know about governance and how important um, that is to our organisations. And this is a bit of a shameless plug um, for my organisation. Um, but in 2022, we were recognised as Business of the Year for our by our local Chamber of Commerce um, through their Business Excellence Awards. We also took out the Aboriginal Engagement Award and the Not-for-Profit Award, which is how we ended up with the Business of the Year Award. Um, 
We're very grateful for this recognition, but what I actually want to highlight um, is that it's really important that your organisations put yourself in a space where you can be seen by these businesses, but also that um, you are getting recognition for the awesome work that you do. Um, we have to stop preaching the, to the converted and the ESG trend is a really uh, exciting opportunity to do this. Um, basically, I just want to say that we, we have governance up the wazoo. We've been doing it and been tested on it for a long time um, and we have some really good structures in place. Um, obviously, our governance structures are founded on transparency and accountability, strong collaboration with diverse stakeholders and finally, um, our ability to engage with industry and um, to encourage sustainable practices. And these are all really think all really important things to deliver um, in the ESG outcome space. So that's the end of my sort of alignment theory uh, kind of uh, with the TNFD. Now I just want to make some points about strategic focus and I imagine that none of this will be news to you but um, just in case you're new to the space or um, that, that this is new to you, knowing your priorities and having a focus on what you want to achieve um, versus what can be done by someone else is really important in the ESG space. Um, understanding how you want to deliver how what you want to deliver might align with someone else's priorities and how you can add value to their challenge or solve a problem is really important. Um, as an example, in our region, there's a lot of interest in supporting First Nations engagement um, in NRM activities. So NAC NRM has had a range of programs since 2017, uh, which we deliver in partnership with several First Nations organisations. In addition to government funding we receive, um, we now have two ESG projects which support additional training for our range of teams and provide additional um, operational opportunities to engage with other NRM projects. This is always done in consultation with traditional owners to, um, and custodians to ensure that there is alignment and to provide the best opportunities for right-way science. As a result of engaging with other organisations in consultation activities, particularly in the oil and gas space, we're also pitching for some other priority projects. So I guess the point there is just around um, being seen at some of those conversations and starting to make some of those connections with some of those industries that we haven't historically had um, probably long connections with. Um, all of our organisations have been around for a long time and we all have corporate knowledge of good projects that were no longer sexy enough to get funding from the government or were no longer a government priority. But they were still good projects and yielded good outcomes and um, could be resurrected to meet the needs of, um, a, you know, a, an ESG outcome. Values-driven ESG opportunity uh, partnerships are an opportunity to build upon that corporate knowledge and apply what we have learned over time and deliver more good outcomes on the path to repairing nature. We, um, as an organisation, have a number of shelf-ready projects that we have um, that we can resurrect to at any time, pretty much to. Um, be able to uh, advocate or pitch to an entity that might be looking for an outcome in a particular space. And I suppose that's one other thing that I would say about our experience with um, working with partners is typically they have an idea in mind about something, about what they want to achieve. So it's about understanding, um, you know, where they're coming from and knowing your partner. So kind of that leads me into my... Um, into my conclusion, which I just want to summarise by acknowledging that there is a maze of information available out there. And if some of you are already sort of working in this space, you will have already navigated. Um, but if you haven't really started to dive in yet, um, just start reading. It, it does all make sense eventually. Um, know what your role and your organisation um, wants to, how your organisation wants to play in this ecosystem. There's a lot of touch points, opportunities, um, but different organisations will have different capacity and interest to engage. Um, but, but the thing that's really important is to get outside of your normal circle of um, engagement and to be seen and be part of those business conversations. We need to think about being um, more part of those, those business interactions. 
The second thing is to know your investors. Um, so for your geographic area, um, what types of industries? Are they going to be more interested in social or environmental outcomes? In our experience, um, the small to medium enterprises are looking for localised benefit generally go to social outcomes first. But NRM has the capacity to deliver social and environmental. Don't be afraid to use that as a way to start the conversation. We actually do do a lot in the social space. Also know what sort of disclosures and reporting are going to be relevant for your local industry. Um, are they part of a very large entity that has a local footprint and therefore needs to undertake climate and soon will need to do um, the TNFD disclosures as well? Or are they a smaller entity who are part of a supply chain that might need to be um, reporting up to their customer who has a reporting obligation? And what are you going to? What are your data requirements going to be? And what are their data requirements going to be? It's another whole conversation in the data space. And the third thing is to know your strategy um, back to front. Um, it goes back to knowing your role, but also speaks to being clear about what you're trying to achieve for your region and for your organisation. And um, different organisations are going to have different priorities. Obviously, for us um, in WA, being independent, not-for-profits, um, we are always looking for ways to bring revenue into the organisation to deliver project outcomes where, um, because we, we don't have a lot of... Um, state government investment in NRM in WA, where other states may have um, a greater, be able to have a greater focus on the partnership um, because they might be able to bring um, state government investment to the table and leverage some of that corporate investment um, in that way, which is a slightly different conversation potentially. So that is basically the end of my presentation, but I'm very happy to answer um, <laughs> questions if anyone has any, but I will... Um, stop sharing all right thanks Catherine that was a really good overview um so for questions everyone if you want to unmute and you can stick up your actual or virtual hand and I'll try and make sure I can see everybody did anyone have a question to lead off for Catherine Oops. making sure I can see everyone I've got a question, Catherine, if people are feeling a bit shy about starting. So um, the question that I had was you mentioned that you've been involved in sort of two ESG projects so far. Um, I was just wondering if you could lead us through some of the nuts and bolts about either of those examples. Yeah, sure. So basically um, both of those have eventuated through um, – Probably the best way to describe them is direct relationships. And this is why I say it's really important that um, you, you get out of your normal circle of engagement and that we as an NRM industry start to engage more directly with businesses that we're actually playing in that business space um, because those have come about because um, – people are becoming more aware that we're there as an organisation and that we can deliver these kinds of outcomes. So there's communications is something that um, NRM historically is probably not amazing at. Um, it's not that we don't do it. It's just often the resource that, you know, when a budget gets cut, it's one of the first things that we tend to lose um, because it's not as important as doing the on-the-ground stuff. But I think with the introduction of the ESG um, space, uh, we're seeing now that it is really important because it's important for these larger sort of entities to be aware that we can deliver these services in this space. So, but in terms of the nuts and bolts of how that's happened, um, essentially uh, we had a couple of um, different entities that are delivering projects, um, like industrial projects in our region, um, that have already been signed off and approved, but they recognise and they've had um, sort of interest from their board and their executive in delivering some sort of environmental outcome. And they have um, become aware that 
we're here in this in the region and in this space and they've approached us to um, put together a project and generally they've given us some sort of parameters that they're interested in investing in and then we've molded something um, together based on what we want to deliver which is whatever's in our regional NRM strategy and uh, and molded that into a project and there's there's generally a bit of back and forth um, but a lot of from what we're um, what we're delivering at the moment, um, they're sort of they're very early stage and small sorts of projects. I suspect there will be a much stronger framework of um, reporting in particular that will start to come once um, this disclosure stuff gets uh, you know really well implemented in the corporate sector because that will guide exactly what they're going to achieve and there will be more sort of um, direction from organisations that will say, okay, we need to do this particular outcome and then they'll go looking for someone who can deliver that outcome, which NRM industries can do. Thanks, Catherine. So that was, so these are projects that um, the people, of companies, local companies have sort of decided to invest in because of sort of essentially a discrete board decision that they wanted to have environmental investments. It wasn't sort of an offset decision. It was more of a, um, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're basically um, sort of recognising their need for um, a social licence to operate. They're recognising that they need to do something in the community to maintain that social licence to operate. 